subcommittee will resume its uh, hearing. Uh, we'll begin with Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the ranking member on this side, um, we have a slightly different viewpoint, although we're in agreement on 95 percent of what the chairman has asked about and I think what he's uh, moving toward. I am very grateful for the graciousness and the fairness of the chairman <coughs> pointing out that uh, the program has been a target of abuse for, for many, many years, not just during the Reagan years, Republican, the Carter years, Democrat, et cetera. And just to underscore that point briefly, the state of Massachusetts received 73 million in Section 8 housing funds in 79 the largest allocation of any state in the union. Seventy percent of the money raised in Massachusetts by Mr. Carter in uh, 80 was given by Section 8 developers. So the program really has been abused in many ways. Uh, one additional fact, 100 percent uh, Section 8 developers in Massachusetts who contributed to Mr. Carter's campaign received Section 8 projects for approval. So what I'm getting at is what do we do about it? Now, I have a lot of questions. The chairman has asked probably 50 percent of the questions I wanted to have, and I think the answers keep coming out about the same way, but I'm really interested in how can this happen? How can this continue? And I'm going to get into your feelings and why you would continue to, to use a system that obviously is open to abuse. A couple of quick things. I'm learning a great deal about housing generally and becoming a HUD expert specifically against my will. And I now feel like I am one. But I need for you to explain a couple of things to me. The difference in the capabilities or talents that Mr. Wynn and Mr. Wilson brought. Now, in your brief explanation of what each one contributed to the so-called Wynn group, to which you referred, Mr. Wynn, you said, brought uh, the knowledge in acquiring equity participation. And I think you said that Wilson brought knowledge in capital markets. Now, can you give me the difference in the kind of uh, monies that they could bring into a project? Yes, sir. I believe I can. In, in layman's language. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Congressman, I believe what I testified to previously this morning was uh, essentially that Mr. Wynn's role involved acquisition of properties, property management, and equity participation. And by participation, I really mean uh, specifically that he provided the cash and the letters of credit that are required to close initially with the project mortgage. In Mr. Wilson's case, I believe I also testified this morning that Mr. Wilson's knowledge of capital markets, and by that I mean the second, primary and secondary markets, was instrumental in determining how we would structure a project mortgage. Forgive me for interrupting. At that point, I would like you to lay out in layman's language the difference between what function they served financially. Mr. Wynn would go to the primary markets. Uh, Mr. Wynn would go to his personal resources in order well, to meet equity. He had access to, to private money, and that would be to personal. his own. That's correct. It, it, and obviously, had a, he had a if you will, an open credit uh, with the bank or a line of credit with the bank where he could draw up on that. He did at one that point. That is known as primary, or that's known as primary funding. That's correct. All right. Now explain to me a little more specifically for those of us who've never financed multi-million dollar projects. If the front, if the first line of funding fails, you go to what's known as secondary market. Is that true or do you simply use it as an additional part of the funding? What is the general approach to funding a multi-million dollar project? In our case, uh, Mr. Chairman, with Jenny May mortgage-backed securities, those securities were sold in the secondary market. They were pooled with other project mortgages and sold in a blind pool to investors through the Government National Mortgage Association. And that kind of financing is considered greater more secure than simply a bank loan or guaranteed loan? or It guarantees to the investor the timely repayment of principal and interest on the project mortgage. If there's default or foreclosure, it pays off in cash rather than debentures. Right. To the Casper Spring Hill project, are you saying, and this is an interesting point that the chairman did bring up, that Mr. Wilson received 50 percent because he was in control of the project? There has to be a reason why one person receives more than the others, irregardless of the talent they bring or the capability they bring. Was it his project? Essentially, he, was he founded and developed owner. it, therefore he was the primary beneficiary. He was the majority owner, Congressman. I believe what I testified to this morning was that uh, the fact that I was not party to the negotiations and establishing, setting up the limited partnership. Right. I, I certainly accept that. I don't mean for you to testify to more than you can, which I think you're not doing. But to the best of your knowledge, I, I want to go over this. There must be some reason, this does uh, tickle my, uh, my inquisitive mind a bit, that why would a person who had no money at risk receive 50 percent? 
So we're saying essentially you believe that it was his project to begin with. He had control of it. And he was giving out. As an owner. He was assigning the percentages to the various investors. No, I don't believe I said that, Congressman. Well, I'm not. Uh, I'm if asking. I did, then I'm incorrect. I'm uh, what I believe I said this morning was that Mr. Wynn and Mr. Wilson negotiated the interest in that set of three projects. All right. To the, the ownership best of your knowledge. I'm sorry. Uh, the ownership interest, I meant. To the best of your knowledge, when a group such as the Wynn Group, comprised basically three people with whom you worked on many occasions, approaches a project, is it normal procedure for one of them to take the lead on that project? Project A, Project B, Project C, so that one person is not always in the lead on a project. Yes, it is, Congressman. When that occurs, will that person have a moral, legitimate, business, historic reason to receive more from that project than a person that didn't uh, fund or didn't locate it, didn't create it, and uh, didn't uh, form it? I'm trying to find some reason, Could like you the chairman and the other members, why a person who put up no money receives a controlling interest in the project. Simply because of a business agreement between Mr. Wynn and Mr. Wilson, Congressman. And you have no reason as to why that occurred? I do not, sir. You just don't I, know. I would not speculate. Thank you very much. When we talk about access to allocation, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm kind of immune to the term now, influence peddling. It, I'm desensitized. I've heard it enough. We've uh, heard a lot about it. And when witnesses come, they, they have a tendency to shy away from it and understand it. Um, it's unfortunate, but it is probably the best term for describing what really happens when a project is hung up in the internal workings of bureaucracy. You hire someone who can break it loose. Is that not true? That is true. And that basically can be described as influence peddling or contact. Or networking. Or networking. Is that a vital ingredient to almost every housing project with which you have been associated? Both during my time in HUD and outside HUD, yes, Mr. Congressman. And as far as every other project about which you have any knowledge, is it also usually a vital ingredient? Yes, it is, Mr. Congressman. So that some projects may move smoothly, but probably they were still greased a bit by someone knowing someone or knowing the system, one or the other. Or knowing, having specific knowledge of rules and regulations, pointing out, for example, in my case as Director of Housing, that there were other ways of structuring uh, particular applications. So it's both whom and what you knew. It's a mixture. It is. Where it becomes shadowy for us who sit in public interest on public time and public payroll trying to protect public dollars and in a public glass house, it seems that when the emphasis is on the contact or the insider's connections or influence peddling, that we become, I think from my standpoint, and I know from my standpoint, justifiably concerned. Now, in your mind, when you hired any of the three individuals, and all of them are sure very fine people and did what they thought was completely honest and moral, I'm not seeking judgment on that. I'm trying to understand this process which has led us to these hearings. It, at any time, did you feel that you were abusing the insider connection, the networking, the um, influence peddling? I mean, we can trade the terms, it doesn't matter. I'll call it network and makes you more comfortable. It does, Congressman. I believe that I did not abuse, but rather used the existing rules and procedures that were established by HUD. The process that it had in place up until March of 1988, when the entire mod rehab program was completely restructured, uh, modeled after uh, Congressman Schumer's not here this morning, but after the Housing Development Grant Program, I believe, and those policies and procedures, in which HUD, HUD implemented, I think, essentially for the first time, a, a very competitive selection process throughout the United States. All right, and it me, continues today, I believe. Thank you. Let me go to suggestions for, for solutions. I don't know that questioning you for two hours will elicit any more information than we basically have, the knowledge we possess now about the process of these various projects with which you've been associated. At what stage do you think that insider contact or networking is disproportionately important to the survivability or the, or the existence of a project. I mean, at what stage would you call quits, having been an insider and having been a uh, regional housing administrator? At what point would people come to you and ask for too much? What is that cutoff point? 
there, obviously you're going to have to have a contact or should have a contact with anyone promoting a project. And I would not feel comfortable if that person gave up the first time bureaucracy said no if he believes in his project. At what point, at a key decision making level, would you say this guy's too much or this gal's pushing too hard? Give me a frame of reference. Give me some perspective on decision making from your standpoint as a former employee of HUD, key employee of HUD. Within HUD, Congressman. Uh, there were mortgagors and mortgagees who brought a variety of proposals to my staff and ultimately to me. Uh, I typically was uh, crisis oriented in terms of underwriting. Uh, I would try to delegate as much authority and responsibility as I could to the staff. Uh, there were mortgagors and mortgagees who asked for bizarre requests, uh, bizarre proposals. Would your delegation of authority to subordinates been motivated both by creating a protective shield for yourself when you finally made the decision that you had some good technical and professional advice about which to base your ultimate decision. And secondly, to utilize the talents of those people who are hired to do just precisely that. I wouldn't utilize them as a shield, Congressman, but rather in terms of degree of specialization and area of specialization. I had a variety of technical specialists, for example, appraisers, architects, cost analysts, mortgage credit examiners. All of them are highly refined, highly complex areas. Okay. Now we come to the question, the second area that bothers me a little bit, not too much perhaps, but it bothers me. I can understand trying to overturn technical decisions, which you think are wrong. And I, I share my, my chairman's concern that 25% is a little high in terms of the times that you probably would have rejected or attempted to overturn a technical decision, especially from the area of the economist. Is that correct? An economist. Did I, or I other technical that? disciplines, Congressman. Tell me why. Simply because of uh, difference in perceiving information. Uh, I would be influenced, objectively now, by particular state housing agencies who knew their markets, their housing markets, much better than we did. Typically, the review by a, a HUD economist is done from a, a desk much like this table. It's not done in the field. You don't get the perspective, in my view, of hands-on experience, of being out in the community and knowing the local housing needs and their objectives in terms of implementing housing assistance. I'm almost afraid to ask this question because I probably know the answer to it in advance, but are you aware of any program within HUD to monitor those decisions that were overturned uh, two years later to see how the projects turned out? The audit function, certainly, Congressman. Pardon me? The audit function. Uh, while I was with the HUD. audit function? Yes, sir. There were a variety of program audits that were conducted during my 13-year career. Which opens up a, a whole Or program new evaluation studies that were done. For example, I mentioned in my opening statement that I, in fact, was a program analyst for HUD and I was involved in the quantitative and qualitative evaluation of housing programs. If you served in that function, do you personally sign off on that evaluation? Yes, I did, sir. I so accepted that responsibility. You were a project evaluator for a specific singular project? For a specific project or program. Well, Correct. from time to time. You, you, right. But you personally signed off on that? I did. To whom, not to what? office, but to whom did you forward your evaluation? Uh, hierarchically, it would have gone from, uh, from myself to my supervisor at that time, up through the Office of Program Planning oh, and Evaluation. Stop, stop. One of the problems we have is lack of accountability. And everybody funnels these things upward at the rate of, uh, at the rate of uh, speed of light, and no one ever signs anything saying, yes, this was it, and I saw it, and it's mine, it's my responsibility. If you send it to the next echelon, does that, did that person, and to your knowledge, does that person in that specific office to which and, and uh, title to whom you would send it, have a responsibility for signing off that he concurs with it or disagrees with it? Yes, he does. In writing. Then where does it go? It uh, depends on the type of decision, uh, but ultimately to, in my case, to the regional administrator in Denver. All right, but at each level up to the regional administrator, someone signs off his or her professional opinion on the validity of that report. That's correct. There is an explicit paper trail. Now, we have hundreds of these reports, and I've read several. My mind, to use the chairman's off-repeated phrase, is boggled by the size of the job. Anyone wants to go in there and clean up hood. Who, what requires action? At what point, when you get all these problems, including the IG's reports, as well as the audit reports, the evaluation reports, what happens to them? They just sank in a mire of, of muck. I, mean, I, I don't know that any action was ever taken anywhere on anything. What happens at what level to trigger 
some kind of internal bureaucratic reaction to a problem that everybody recognizes. Congressman, during my time at HUD, uh, the what happened was essentially that there were ongoing program evaluations. Uh, for example, the Section 8 new construction program and, and substantial rehabilitation program uh, as they were administered in the Denver region. Pardon me. I, you know, so I they, think that they I provided can, warning signals if there were problems. I think that I can reduce a lot of um, sophisticated, very complex problems to a 15 second TV bite. It probably makes most politicians bite conscious. And as a result, they don't spend a lot of time in depth in many issues. But this is one we cannot avoid. And you're speaking to me, and in, in, I hate to say this, in a language that's a little bit foreign to me, at least a little strange to me. I, I don't understand what you just said in terms of individuals reacting to this problem. Now, you have an ongoing review. That's correct. Who has the ongoing review? In the Denver Regional Office, that function was delegated and assigned to the Office of Program, uh, Program Planning and Evaluation, if With it still exists. due respect and deference, let me tell you that. We probably have 20 ongoing reviews in HUD which led us into this mess. At what point does an appointed official inside HUD, is he required to take action on a problem? I mean, we have studied this thing now for 11 years. The abuse and misuse goes back to 1965, the founding year. We haven't got any solutions to anything yet. I am baffled by the lack of inattention to IG reports, danger signals, warnings. There is simply no reaction machinery inside HUD. You're the fourth witness, to my best of my memory, I can recall saying, ongoing review. Nothing happens. It just goes on and on and on. I'm suggesting, Congressman, that there was a review function. Whether or not decisions were reached on the basis of the findings, I don't know. Well, let me I just, wasn't. We probably can't solve the thing here, but let me try to understand better and hopefully bring some light on this, uh, some heat on this, on this situation that just keeps going on. Is there not a time limit to the amount of time, amount of, uh, time you can spend studying a problem? doesn't come to an end where it's referred to some action person or action agency for action. God, I can't find anybody who ever acted on a complaint except to form did, another sir. review committee. I did. In the Denver region. Give me an example, please. On uh, particular projects where there were warning signals about... Uh, MHR, coinsurance, I mean, what are we talking about? I'm talking about full insurance at that time, sir. Coinsurance didn't exist uh, prior to the time I left HUD. Uh, I saw warning signals, my staff provided them to me, and I took decisive action. I signed off, uh, I took the authority and I exercised it as best I could for HUD in professional service. Then is it safe to assume that I can ask you and you will give, answer in the affirmative that, to your knowledge, there are no real programs in coinsurance in Denver Regional Office today? Active programs? Yes. I would think uh, that the 221D4 coinsurance program, particularly the Retirement Service Center component, is inactive at the present time. There are a number of mortgages that were coinsured, but I believe there are no new developments that are being proposed. I, I want to wrap up. I want to learn something from this. I think I know the other members do too. What do you suggest is step by step, it, succinctly, for solving the problem, the massive problem that faces Secretary? Kemp, you were original, were original administrator. That's one of the key positions in the whole program. Uh, director of Housing, Acting Director Sorry, and Director, director of, of Development. What would you recommend at this stage again this committee look at in terms of correcting uh, the abuses built into the structure? I believe Secretary Kemp has already taken that step uh, perhaps uh, last week and again yesterday when he testified before the House Banking Committee on, I believe, 58 reform proposals. I think, uh, based on my limited review of those proposals, I agree with a number of them. I certainly support the publication in the Federal Register of all of HUD's funding actions. I think that's an excellent... Of all of HUD what? ...funding actions, for whether it's Community Development Block Grant Program or the Assisted Housing Programs. Let me wrap up by asking you briefly to comment on... MHR we've, we've covered until I think death do us part. What about foreclosed property sales? The lack of monitoring of those sales, and, and uh, some people got in the program, sold, and walked away, and we never knew what hit us. <laughs> I really didn't have any involvement during my time at HUD. So you're not uh, familiar with that area? No, I'm not. I'm certainly not an expert in that area. All right, let me quickly ask you then, uh, what about coinsurance? Do you feel qualified to comment on that? Yes, I do. All right. W how do we control the coinsurance? By using too few people with too many of the projects? Uh, lenders, are you speaking For about? For example, just that two major co-insurers, I understand. 
There were at the time. That's correct. I assume you're speaking. Is that a that. mistake to just have a couple rather than spreading around more? Yes, I think you would, should encourage uh, diversity of lenders, uh, conservative underwriters, and subject them to frequent quality control reviews by HUD staff, knowledgeable HUD staff. Any other suggestions on that in that area? Uh, increased oversight on your part here as a committee. What about the FHA problem? I'm sure you're familiar with funding. Speaking of single family, Congressman? Yes. I think you've uh, seen virtually all the abuses that have occurred or could occur in the single family home mortgage programs. And what would you do to correct them? Exactly what is the measures that are being implemented now? All right, well, let me just very quickly sum up. We have billions of dollars in MHR. We don't know what the loss is going to be. The chairman's uh, estimated, uh, I think, two and a half billion at one time. And I, I think it will go higher, personally. I think we're just underestimating the whole thing. Half a million, at least, in uh, foreclosed property sales. Probably go to a billion before we're done. Over a billion in coinsurance will be the loss. And we're looking at four to five billion loss in, in FHA. And I'm just hopeful that uh, we at least stanch the tide I'm really looking for more suggestions to help us solve the problem right now than I am uh, uh, continuing in what, uh, you know, mucking around in a swamp what we know is hopefully not endless and hopefully has some bottom. I uh, appreciate your testimony. I think that um, you people who are professional in HUD truly had a greater responsibility to monitor more of these programs. You've quoted to me here under oath that you, have, you took action when you were there. But it seems there was a, a, an avalanche to get out of HUD and get into the real money. And I am... There was certainly a brain drain within HUD, particularly in 1984. It was more than a brain drain, in, in all fairness. And allow me just to wrap up, because I'm through. You have no more questions to answer where I'm concerned. There was an avalanche of talent and semi-talented people to get into the money market. And they got into it. And they've abused it. And they made the whole system... It, it is it, sagging under the impact of too few people making too much money, and they may have made it legally, they may have made it ethically and in their judgment fairly, but the image to the people out there in middle America and all throughout the United States who have to pick up the tab for our failure to catch it, for your, your failure to monitor more closely when you're in and, and go on record with these, this, these are danger signs, these are warning signals, uh, we're all paying a terrible price for it right now. And as a result, I think it casts shadows, rightly or wrongly, on anyone in the MHR business. And I think you all have a, a major responsibility now to help rebuild the effectiveness of the profession that, uh, of which you're a part. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Weiss. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Keenan, if uh, I may, I'd like to go back to, for clarification purposes, uh, to the questions that the chairman was asking you about the, uh, this memo of April 22, 1988. Uh, and Mr. Wilson's assignment regarding uh, Mr. Maples. Uh, tell me why he was brought into the situation. As a limited partner? No, no, no. Why he was brought into to the assignment of dealing with Mr. Maples. Mr. Maples? Yeah. Uh, for his persuasive powers in advancing the argument in terms of a market rejection, I had attempted uh, through career program staff to put forth all the information that was necessary for them to overturn their but why, decision. Why would, would he have been more qualified to deal with Mr. Maples than you, uh, for example? He was on the same plane or essentially above Mr. Maples and HUD's organizational structure during their times that they served jointly in HUD. Oh, I so so that peer to peer effectively. So that in fact what what he what he was doing was asked to do was to utilize his prior association with Mr. Maples in furthering this project. Is that correct? His relationship with Maples. That's right. Okay. Um during the time that uh, you were the, the housing director at the Den Denver Regional Office? I was the acting director of housing and the director of housing development at various right. times. Uh, did you receive any uh, requests from uh, Mr. Pierce or Mr. Pierce's office, Ms. Dean or Mr. Wilson, uh, as to uh, applicants for mod rehab units? Never, sir. Um, in the course of 
the very many projects that you worked on. Uh, you'd indicate that you'd hired some people for help in the allocation process. Um, there are some stories, some newspaper stories, indicating that you were involved at times in going to local housing authorities and explaining to them what was available by way of allocations. In, did you in fact do that? Explaining uh, the availability at the national level of Section 8 Mod Rehab, that's correct, through trade journals that I would read. Uh, typically the Housing and Development Reporter, Housing Affairs Letter. And did you, in the course of, of any of those discussions, uh, tell those local housing authority people that in fact you could get them if they made the application, that you could assure them of, uh, uh, of, of the allocation of units? I never did, Congressman. Did you have discussions about what, what your role could be in helping them getting allocation? I did not. That any suggestions about that uh, would be wrong or an error? I agree with you, Congressman. Yeah? That they would be wrong. Okay. Um, in how many instances besides the Spring Hill apartment? Are you aware of Mr. Wilson uh, being assigned to speak with people at the various HUD offices on the base of his prior association while he was with HUD with some of those people? No other instances, Congressman. The only one that you're aware of is the Casper, uh, Wyoming, the Spring Hill apartment situation. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. There are only two lines of inquiry I have. Uh, it is seldom that we have any, uh, well, I shouldn't say seldom, but uh, occasionally we have good news in these hearings. And I uh, caught uh, something Mr. Queenan uh, said about um, the Tucson uh, Housing Authority being one of the best public housing authorities. I just wanted to amplify on that just a bit. Now, that's not in my congressional district, nonetheless. Could you uh, tell us a little bit more about this Tucson project? I really am interested in, in uh, uh, learning just a little bit more about the role that Ms. Murphy played there and that you played in that project. Uh, yes, Congressman. The Tucson Housing Authority, I believe, applied for between 50 and 60 units of Section 8 moderate rehabilitation. Under the competitive selection procedures that were implemented in March of 1988 by HUD, their particular interest was in developing transitional housing, which generally speaking is uh, not encouraged, in my view, under the Section 8 moderate rehabilitation program. There were a variety of needs in terms of information needs that the Housing Authority had to develop and submit to HUD. They were funded by HUD in fiscal 88, I believe, Congressman. Uh, they have, it's my understanding in talking subsequently with the Housing Authority Director, uh, developed or are developing that property. I offered my services to them on a pro bono basis if they were unable to find financing, if they were unable to put together a permanent loan package, simply because of my uh, personal relationship with the Housing Authority Director. And it was an uh, excellent one. Uh, thank you. And, and uh, how did Ms. Murphy uh, uh, come into play in this then? I retained uh, Ms. Murphy or her firm for uh, trying to advance all the arguments that were necessary during the competitive selection process in terms of particular needs of that PHA for transitional housing. What were her particular uh, uh, attributes that uh, uh, suggested that she could do that job uh, well. She had, uh, I believe, a multi-year career within HUD in part as the uh, director of the Office of State Agency and Bond Finance Program. So she was extremely knowledgeable uh, about the bond market, also very close and knowledgeable about PHAs throughout the United States. So would you characterize her contribution to the effort as the application of expertise rather than contacts and relationships? Joint, Congressman. I'm sorry? Joint. Both. Both? Right. Uh, you mentioned some contacts with members of the congressional delegation. Could you expand on that at all for us, please? Yes, I believe the uh, Housing Authority, on its own initiative, uh, enlisted the support of Senator DeConcini and uh, Senator McCain. I don't believe that's in your district, Congressman? Is that correct? Uh, no, Tucson is not in my district, right. but of course the two senators would be key players throughout right. the state. And I believe they congr contacted Congressman Udall. I'm not certain at that point, but I do know about uh, their efforts to enlist the support of Senator McCain and Senator DeConcini, bipartisan support. And as far as you know, that project is moving forward? Uh, I believe it is, Congressman. I haven't spoken with the director or his staff in some time. 
They haven't called me, so I assume there are no problems. All right. You, uh, and the chairman brought this out, I think, very well. You applied uh, a lot of experience and considerable expertise to the projects in which you were involved. Uh, my, my final two or three questions uh, uh, go to the uh, problem that has uh, been the subject of most of the hearings that we've held here, and that is uh, the degree to which these particular programs uh, were run on the basis of who you know rather than what you know. And I want to ask you whether or not it bothers you that there were a lot of people who made a lot more money in this area based upon their contacts and relationships than you did, uh, presumably based upon your technical knowledge and expertise. Doesn't that bother you? It does, Congressman. Uh, and doesn't that suggest that there in fact, was something very drastically wrong with some of these programs? It does, Congressman. And I gather that that's part of the reason, anyway, why you indicated that you supported a lot of the ideas that Secretary Kemp had recently announced to try to deal with these problems and uh, allow these programs to be based upon merit. For example, the allocations to be based upon merit rather than influence. Is that correct? It is. Thank you. Congressman Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> you were an employee um, who worked at HUD for, I think, thir uh, 13 years. Is that not correct? That is correct, yeah. Congressman. And um, during the time that you worked uh, at HUD, what was the going rate for consultants? I believe, Congressman, from street knowledge now, uh, somewhere between $500 to $1,000, up to $2,000 over time. And, and you left HUD? Uh, <coughs> When? What was the year that you left? March 2nd, 1984, Congressman. So, so uh, previous to 1980, you were aware there was street talk then that consultants uh, received so much per unit? There was. Okay. Uh, and it continued, the price got higher. Why did the price get higher? I believe because the resources became more limited. So what we see is a situation where you might have had 100,000 units uh, a little easier to get units, and it dropped down to anywhere down to 10,000 units a year. So uh, I believe the peak, Congressman, would have been approximately 400,000 400, units nationally. Okay. And it dropped down to your understanding of what? Oh, certainly mod rehab down from 7,500 to 5,000, I believe, most recently. Mm -hmm. So would you say that it became even more uh, important given the, the limited numbers uh, available that the consultants played a greater role or they played the same role? I think they played a greater role, Congressman, until March of 1988 when the new procedures were implemented by HUD. Okay. Um, I have to tell you that if um, I was an employee making $40,000 and and I knew how the system worked and I really felt I was the expert and probably uh, isn't it true developers probably came to you to s just even seek advice on how to proceed? Yes, they did. Okay. And, and which, of course, you, you charge them nothing. Yes, of course. Okay. Um, so you're giving out a lot of free advice on how they can make a, a killing in this industry, very honestly. Um, what made you decide to give up a very important career? You were, um, what was your final title before you left? Director of Housing Development, Congressman for the Denver Regional Denver District. Region, a six-state area. Okay. Well, you had an important job. You were paid $40,000. Uh, people came to you to seek advice, and you would share it uh, without uh, being asked to be reciprocated. And um, what, what just dawned on you to, to get out of that line of work uh, on the government side and become one of the developers, the very kind of people you had been advising and working with? Who, who initiated that? Did, did that was my personal decision, Congressman. Okay. I had been offered at the time I left HUD a uh, position in Washington, D.C., and I declined the position. I did, decided... Let me just ask you this. Did ever a developer say, what, what, why are you in this line of work? Why don't you get on the outside and you know so much? I mean, did anybody ever say that to you? Uh, many developers, Congressman, okay. also but, former regional administrators of HUD. Okay. But isn't it true that, um, that one developer in particular kind of just forced you to come to grips with this issue and... And, uh, uh, one regional administrator, yeah. Mr. Shepard. And what did he say to you? Uh, sounds boastful. 
Pardon uh, me? It sounds boastful, Congressman, no, but that's essentially right. in a luncheon meeting one-on-one -on -one with him when he first became regional administrator, he said that uh, I have talked to a number of experts in the field. They feel that you are the top expert, uh, certainly in the Denver region. And if, uh, if all the reports about you are true in terms of your expertise and your knowledge, then I suggest you leave HUD. Okay. That was in 1981. Right. It took me three years to leave. Yeah, because it's a major career change, and uh, you're getting a Bless salary, and now you're going to go out on your own, and, and you're going to see how you, how you do, do in, this, uh, in this world. Um, and, and you've done very well based, uh, uh, I think, primarily on the knowledge that you brought to the job. But, but let me ask you this, because um, I wasn't going to get into your income, but I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the response that you gave to the chairman. Over time, you said you, your income basically averaged about a quarter of a million dollars a year. That's correct. Does that include the retained earnings in Chapter S corporations? Yes, it does. Is that after-tax income or pre-tax income? That's after-tax income. Okay, so this is after you've paid your taxes. And expenses, that's correct. Okay, and all your expenses. Correct. So when I, when I if, if someone said he made $100,000 and he may end up paying 25000 in taxes uh, or more, um, you've already netted that out. So your gross That's income correct. was was maybe even close. Well, I was in a 33% tax bracket, so we can work backwards. Okay. Plus, you took all your expenses and so on out of that. That's so, correct. Um, when you contributed $100,000, uh, you were taking it from after-tax income of a quarter of a million. That's correct, Congressman. Does that also include the present value of already earned income, uh, that uh, such as tax credits that may uh, accrue to you in, in future years? Uh, development fees Let through the sale of tax way. credits. If you were not to do any more work, you were just to clo close, about up, close up shop, would you still be receiving income from some of these properties? Yes, I would, Congressman, from two properties. Uh, where there, on the syndication, there are, uh, there's an installment payment schedule, and there are two payments remaining on two specific projects. Well, it's, it's fairly clear that, that, um, that you've been very successful, and, and, uh, but it's also clear that you, uh, you knew how HUD operated and, and you knew what you had to do to have it work right. The most important thing, and I, I put this on the record, is the expertise that you brought to your job. Um, and um, I look, uh, you know, I listen to the line of questioning of our chairman, and, and uh, I have to say, I'm surprised you didn't get the 50%. And some of the other people got the six and seven percent, except for one important ingredient. Uh, uh, if you don't have the allocation, you don't have the project. How many projects um, did you attempt to get through HUD, and how many did you get? I was successful, Congressman, on 20 projects, and I was unsuccessful on 15 projects over a four-plus year period. But um, 20 projects is a lot of projects. Um, it is, Congressman. Seeing 15 go down after spending a lot of time, I mean, would you have actually worked out? You would have, in all 15, would you have gone through all your proposals and so on? Your not each, uh, Congressman, <coughs> certainly not the tax credit proposals. But in all cases, the owner's proposal, and in most cases, the coinsurance application, if it got to that stage. Is it fair to say that you can't get funding for a project if you don't have the rent subsidies? Uh, no, it's not, Congressman. I have done market rate developments, that is, those that are not assisted by HUD. Let me put it differently. Uh, obviously, to have rent subsidies is an important ingredient in getting financing, isn't it? It is, Congressman. Yeah. Uh, but my understanding is that helps you get the financing, but uh, it really pays your bills up to a certain point, the 15-year rent subsidy, 10-year, whatever. There, there's a point when that rent subsidy runs out. Is that not 15 correct? years on yeah. mod rehab. Okay. That's correct. On the old mod rehab. Right. But, but the real key, the real... The way that you as a developer make your money is from the rent subsidies, isn't that correct? No, I would say just the opposite, Congressman. I don't mean the rent subsidies, I mean the tax credits. That is correct. But in order to get the tax credits, you would need to have the rent subsidies. No, not necessarily, Congressman. You can do what is referred to as a standalone deal. Uh, that is without a subsidy. It's simply a market rate development where the rents are skewed for uh, tax credit purposes. Uh, where you actually reduce them for lower income individuals? That's correct. But obviously, uh, it's nice to have the rent subsidies that... It's very desirable. Okay. So, I mean, you know, we can... It, technically, <clears throat> you could get a, a, rent, a, a tax credit without a rent subsidy, but in order to make a project work, rent subsidies are an important ingredient. If you're trying work. to do an ideal property, that's correct. Yeah. 
I mean, that's what this is all about. You're trying to get the red subsidies, and then you go to the state to get the tax credits. Isn't that correct? It is. Okay. The tax credits, it's my understanding, is, is the upfront cash flow uh, that uh, during the course of the, of the 15 year or 30 year or 20 year or 30 or 40 year project, you get your rent subsidies in the first few years. 15, principally. Okay. Well, isn't it true in, in, in a number of instances, um, we we'll say most of the projects you had with the wind group, that the rent subsidies, um, give me the, t I'll ask the question differently, give me the typical uh, way a rent subsidy is, is paid back to the developer, a way, the way you benefit from the syndication, so on. When, when is this process? I see that as two questions, Congressman, if I could. You can, yeah, if you want to restate the question and answer okay. them, it's fine. I'll try to address the Section 8 question okay. first and then the tax credit question second. The uh, Section 8 side is, has a gross rent of that uh, if there are, for example, individual utility allowances approved by the Housing Authority for the specific property. You deduct the utility allowance and arrive at a contract rent. It is that rent that is paid by the federal government, HUD in this case, yeah. over a period of 15 years. Let's focus on the tax credits. That's what right. I'm interested in. Um, the rent subsidies pay your bills. They don't give you any extra money, uh, basically, to, to go into other new projects and so on. It's, it, it, that is correct. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole, uh, the rent subsidies is supposed to make you basically whole. It helps pay some of your mortgage for a period of time. But the bottom line is the cash, what really is fought over is the tax credits. I mean, that's, that's the prize. And that at one correct. time it was 4%, and then we added another 9% in 1986. So you have 13% uh, tax credits ultimately if combined that can be very rewarding to a developer. It can be. Okay. When do you get that money or, on a usual basis? That's my question to you. Assuming, Congressman, that uh, the tax credits are sold through a public fund, uh, most of the syndicators have arrived at an installment schedule, a performance schedule, if you will. The typical structure is, uh, in my experience, 25% uh, upon uh, execution of limited partnership and admission of the new limited partners, 25% upon completion of rehabilitation, 25% uh, upon break-even analysis, that is, income and expenses are equal to each other for some period of time, typically three to six months. And finally, preparation of the tax return at the partnership level, summing up to 100%. Uh, that last one, um, explain that. When would that be? That would be after the tax year for the project. Okay. So it's, it's conceivable that in a number of these projects, within two or three years, uh, the, the developers could get uh, most of the benefit from a tax credit. In my experience, that's correct, Congressman. So it's an early payback of the system. You can almost walk away from the project, and you've, got, you've made some money off of it. Is that not correct? You could. Yeah. And in many cases, in your instance, you didn't retain, uh, at least with the wind group, uh, ownership beyond uh, the tax credits. I mean, your interest was basically the tax credits. Up to the point of the sale of the tax credits, I became at that point a withdrawing limited partner. I had no continuing ownership interest. So when we take projects like Rolling Green and Sierra Vista and Windsong Apartments, the Sierra Point, uh, Windsor Court, Terrace Apartments, these are the projects you did with the wind group. That's correct. Um, you have no real re uh, vested interest in these projects anymore. I have not, sir, and haven't had since you I believe 87. You basically made your money off of the tax credits. That's correct. Okay. Now, um, in a period of seven, uh, in a period of 11 months, you, along with your partners, now your partners are an illustrious group. I mean, they're, they've been asked before, but uh, uh, we're talking about Philip Wynn, who was the former FHA commissioner in charge of giving out mod rehab. I mean, ultimately, he's in charge of mod rehab. He hires someone named Philip Abrams, who ultimately becomes FHA commissioner, who ultimately becomes the undersecretary, the number two person at HUD. So you teamed up with two of these individuals. I mean, one of them worked, Philip Wynn only worked there eight, uh, one year and eight months. Philip Abrams worked uh, less than four years. He worked three years and two months. And then you teamed up with Lance Wilson, who was the chief of staff. He was right at the very center of, of HUD. And uh, in the judgment of many of us, probably had more control than the secretary himself. That's an opinion. Um, and Lance Wilson left in, in, in June of 84. So what we have is uh, two people who controlled the project 
the program before, someone who was the chief of staff, and someone like you with tremendous expertise, but also um, lots of contacts, you would call it networking re locally. So we've got the Washington, we've got the, and we've got the regional covered pretty well with this, with this WIN group. Now, did you ever feel it was important with the WIN group to hire a consultant? Other than a certified public accountant, no. no. I mean, the bottom line is you guys didn't need a consultant, isn't that true? We definitely did not. Yeah, you didn't need a consultant. You didn't need anybody to move it through the system because you covered all your bases. Nothing we were winners in the congressman's term. Pardon me? We were winners. You, you, were, you were winners in a game where the rules... True. You were winners in a game where you helped write the rules of the game. Not I personally. Okay. Yeah. But um, <coughs> clearly with Lance Wilson, the, the individual is fully employed, working for someone, fully employed, uh, and yet he's a partner with you all. Uh, in one instance, in another project, 50% interest. But you did the work. And he had 50% of the interest. But he did what was essential, and that was he got the units. He got the allocation. And um, your testimony to us is that in the case of your working with Wynn, Abrams, and Wilson, you all never needed to hire a consultant. That is correct, Congressman. Okay. Now, um, you had them in-house. Now, in, in the case of where you needed to have a consultant, um, you mentioned that you hired uh, various individuals. Would you uh, name to me again the individual consultants that you hired? Yes, uh, Congressman, I will. Uh, William Taylor and Associates, Linda Murphy or her firm, uh, Stonebridge Associates. Wait, Linda Murphy or her firm? Is that what you said? Linda Murphy, I believe. No, no I mean, well, we've got to be very clear on this. Well, I have to go back and check for accuracy, Congressman. Yeah. Is there a possibility that you hired her firm and not Linda Murphy? I don't recall, Congressman. I, I can get that information for you, though. Yeah. I'm sorry? I can get that information for okay, you. Okay, that would be helpful. I'll be happy to. So Linda Murphy, uh, you said Mr. Ta Bill Taylor. Taylor. Okay. Uh, Stonebridge Associates. Who, I'm sorry? Stonebridge Associates, okay. I believe his name. And who would be the in key individual there? R. Carter Sanders. Okay. Any others? Uh, the Wind Group testified to that previously. Actually, excuse me, Congressman, uh, Phillips Development Corporation. Okay. So in some instances where you didn't have a direct relationship, you weren't part of the WIND group, the six, seven projects that I mentioned, you, you, you hired uh, Mr. Abrams, the former FHA commissioner, to get units for you? To provide a variety of services, including one involving the allocation process. Right. I mean, that, that's already pretty much been answered. I mean, we don't have to go over that. For the most part, it was to win the allocation. Nothing illegal. I'm not accusing you of doing anything illegal. I want to know, though, isn't it true you hired Mr. Abrams to help win you the units? To assist in awarding the units to the state agency in question. Uh, um, the units were not awarded to me. No, I know that. Okay. Uh, none of these units were ever awarded to you, isn't that correct? That is correct. So you're not telling me anything I don't know. Okay. Okay, or anybody, and, and you're not telling anyone else here. The, the fact is that you needed those projects allocated to the regional office and then to the local PHA for you to have your units, isn't that correct? To have the opportunity, that's yeah. correct. So you were not an indifferent partner here. You wanted those units allocated for I was your... not. Okay. Now, how, uh, with Bill Taylor, um, you were, he was not successful, is that not correct? Uh, let me try to Let me expand. ask you, how many projects did he work for you? Just one. Okay. And was he successful? The uh, allocation had already been made by HUD, Congressman I think it ran back to 1984, 1985, fiscal year. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that's the time period. Uh, the property, I was not successful in developing the property or any other property there. Was, did Mr. Taylor earn his money to you? Did you say to him... How did you decide to reimburse Mr. Taylor? On a negotiated basis, uh, Congressman. The other question, did he earn his money? No. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Uh, what was the negotiated basis? What did you agree with? $20,000. Okay. Uh, if he did what? If the project uh, that I was attempting to develop were funded by the PHA. 
And so he, he got $20,000, but you didn't achieve your objective. Did you ever try to get your money back from Mr. Taylor? I did. And what did he say to you? Or did he ever He respond? refused. Okay. So he kept his money, and he did. Uh, you were out $20,000. That's the uh, cost of doing business in that case. It is, Congressman. Did you uh, ever pay people, um, Linda Murphy, how did you pay her or her law firm? I believe, Congressman, from memory, $2,500 okay. as a retainer and nothing more. Uh, because, uh, but that you, retainer, but did you not have a contingency with Linda Murphy? I did, Congressman. What was the retainer for? Uh, the balance of the fee would have been $47,500, I believe. By the balance of the fee, please explain that. How did you decide to, to arrive at $47,000 plus $2,500? $1,000 a unit times okay, 50 so, units. So nothing new. No. Um, you know, it, it was 500 to 1000 when you worked at HUD uh, under another administration. Now, under this administration, it's harder to get financing, uh, harder to get the allocation. It's $1,000 a unit, and she didn't succeed. Uh, and you put down a small retainer. Um, with the uh, third party that you uh, mentioned to me, uh, what, was, uh, what was the agreement there? Uh, the, s the same, Congressman. How many units? I believe 44 were funded by HUD under the competitive selection procedures, but uh, the only amount I believe I paid was uh, one half of $2,500, so $1,250. Okay, but so much a unit. If That's correct, can. but I was not selected. Now, you had 20 projects. Uh, you've mentioned that you've had 20 projects that were successfully funded. In terms of ownership, that's correct. Yes. In the last, um, in the year 87, 86, 86, 87, six of those were your Win group, the Win Abrams group. Uh, you all got 1,000 of the 8,000 available. You got one-eighth of what was available to the entire country. Um, so you really, you did, you, you won well. Now, let me ask you this. How many other projects in 86, 87 did you win besides these? In that time period, Congressman, without consulting a list uh, that you may have, I believe probably five or six others. Okay. And prior to 86, 87 also. So your testimony in, in 87, you had five or six others? I believe so, Congressman. Okay. What were they? Trenton Apartments in Salt Lake City, uh, Lakeview Apartments in Davis County, Utah, uh, Delmar Apartments in Gillette, Wyoming, which was a multi-year project. And I believe uh, several others, Congressman, I can certainly furnish you that information. Um, why, I can understand, because um, you've already explained, Bill Taylor, you hired him because you heard he was uh, influential in winning units. But, uh, but why, why Linda Murphy? I believe I previously testified, Congressman, to Congressman Kyle that uh, there were really two roles. One was technical and one involved the allocation process. The technical side was in putting forth information to HUD to make sure that the housing authority's request was carefully considered. The technical is what I call influence. That was the contingency part. So you hired her partly to influence the HUD allocation. What was the other part? You've collapsed them, Congressman. Okay, so it's really the influence to, to win the- The, the allocation. Yeah. Okay, the allocation. Um, and who suggested Linda Murphy to you? I don't think anyone suggested uh, her to me. I simply had known Linda for a number of years and respected her. Now, in fairness to you, uh, <clears throat> it's not necessarily a question I thought I'd get, but let me just summarize, and I want to be very clear to, uh, on this. With the Wynn Group, you applied for how many projects and how many were finally s funded? With uh, Mr. Wynn, Mr. Abrams, and yes. Mr. Wilson, yes, uh, I applied for that group uh, for seven. We were successful in six. So six out of seven, admittedly in a time when units were extraordinarily scarce. That's correct. Okay. But you're also telling us that you got five other units funded. From memory, Congressman. Yeah. Well, I mean... I, I didn't get them funded. The PHAs... Uh, yeah, but you ultimately went to conclusion. And in those, you are telling us that you did not hire any consultants? That's correct. Okay. The PHA simply lobbied their congressional delegations. Uh, for example, in Utah, they lobbied Senator Garner and Senator Hatch and were successful. Okay. They were extremely you competent, PHAs. Yield for a yes. second. Yes. On that win group uh, batting average where you say you succeeded in getting six out of seven, Tell us about the seventh project. The seventh project, Congressman, uh, involved the Las Vegas Housing Authority, in which I believe, from memory, 200 units were allocated. We submitted, together with other developers, 
Uh, we were not selected initially. Uh, the Housing Authority came back, made a 166 unit selection in front of us. Our project was ranked second. We were offered by the Las Vegas Housing Authority the opportunity to develop a partially assisted project. I believe we had submitted 168 or 158 units to the PHA. We were offered 45 or 48 units and determined at the partnership level that we would not do the development. No. Subsequently, the Housing Authority went to the next and but, uh, but fourth did the, project. Did the Wynn Group play any role in the units being allocated to Las Vegas? I don't believe so, Congressman. Uh, they lobbied Senator Reid, that is the Housing Authority did, and Senator Hecht at the time. They did not uh, deal with anybody at HUD, to the best of your knowledge? To the best of my knowledge, Congressman. So the units had been allocated prior to their getting into this? Why would they not have lobbied in that case uh, when subsequent they... Subsequent to. Subsequent to, Congressman, are being involved in the first project. The Housing Authority already had the units. They had the units, but it was after the first mod rehab project that we were developing. Um, I, I don't follow you. Okay, let me try again. Uh, the first project that we developed, Congressman, was Sierra Point in Clark County, Nevada. Subsequent to that allocation, there was another allocation by HUD uh, to the Las Vegas Housing Authority. We competed in response to a public Yes, notice. but your testimony is that the Wynn Group played no role in the allocation of those units. That is my testimony, to the best of my knowledge. So, you're, so to answer Congressman Shea's question accurately, the Wynn Group had a perfect batting average with respect to HUD. Every time the Wynn Group went to get units at HUD, they got the units. The seventh project did not involve lobbying HUD. The wind group struck out with the housing authority. Isn't that accurate? The way you've restated it, Congressman, but I, was, I thought I was addressing I'm, I'm not criticizing you. I just want you to clarify it. All right. So in terms you of... You are correct. I am correct. So um, uh, every single time the wind group went to HUD, every single time they got the units. To my knowledge. To your knowledge. I thank my colleague. No, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for asking. That's an extraordinary point. The batting average was 100%. Uh, they got every project they applied for and worked for. And um, uh, Excuse me, yes. Congressman. I believe Mr. Abrams testified previously that uh, there was another PHA uh, which was interested in obtaining mod rehab, and that was not funded. But it never came to a funding stage, so we didn't compete. So we're six for six. That's correct. You know, it's just, um, it, you know, that's why we have to pay close attention, because we have Mr. Wynn and Mr. Abrams here, and they said they got 1,000 units out of 33,000. And I thought, well, that's not so. And then I just found myself looking at the dates, and six of these projects they got in 11 months, and during that 11-month time, they got 1,000 out of 8,000. And so um, a more candid response to me really would have been basically uh, six. Yeah. Well, I, as I understood your question, Congressman, it was how many for which you competed were you selected? Yeah. And that was six of seven in, with that group, as I understood your question. May I ask my colleague sure. to yield again? You know, it's, it's remarkable. The record is even better than, than, than you think it, it was. I send down a memo to you from uh, uh, Phil Abrams to Debbie, Dean. Apparently, they did play a role in getting these units. The units were gotten, but it's the Nevada Housing Authority that didn't give, give all of them to you. Uh, Congressman, this is the Clark County Housing Authority. If that's the other one. That's the one. That's one of the six. That's correct. Okay. Right. Thank you. Let me. Um, are you finished, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Did you work on any other projects be beside the Spring Hill Apartments project with Mr. Wilson? Any other projects? No, Congressman. I did not. So, if we add Mr. Wilson's and Spring Hills was successful, correct? It was, sir. So in every instance that you used Mr. Wilson, you succeeded. 
In every instance in which he was a partner, that's correct. Okay. With no failures. I'm sorry. With no failures. That's correct. Okay. We pretty much established that Mr. Wilson and Mr. Abrams and Mr. Wynn had extensive contacts with Deborah Gordine uh, and that she was advocating those projects that you all were involved in. Uh, excuse me. Um, that's not entirely correct. I withdraw that. Um, let me just ask you this. Um, be before I forget, I just want to get back to one point. You really didn't answer the question because I maybe didn't answer it well. Did you learn about Linda Murphy from looking in the yellow pages? Did you learn from Lin about Linda Murphy? How did you know Linda Murphy was an important player? I had, uh, Congressman, I believe testified twice previously that uh, Linda Murphy and I worked together at HUD. She in Washington, I in Denver. Okay. For a period of years. And she also was a former HUD employee. She was. She was yeah. a director of the state agency and bond finance programs. Why do you think it's so important that the people who seem to get funding are people who seem to have worked in HUD? Do you think that the system was so complex that... I do. That, that's the reason? It's tremendously complex and frustrating to a number of individuals, including PHAs. Well, it's obviously not frustrating for the people like uh, Wynn and Abrams uh, and Lance Wilson and yourself as it relates to six projects. You, you had no frustrations there. You got your... I had frustration, but I also had satisfaction. Okay. Okay. Um, did you have uh, contacts with Tom Demery? During the period in which he was at HUD? Yes. Uh, yes, I did. When did you first meet him? I believe, Congressman, I was introduced to uh, Mr. Demery by Mr. Wynn in December of 1987. It was a fleeting introduction. Now, I let me just get this straight. Mr. Wynn is no longer at HUD. That's correct. So, and he was your partner at the time? Mr. Wynn was? Yes. Yes, he was. So your partner, Mr. Wynn, former FHA commissioner, now introduces you to the present FHA commissioner. Is that correct? I believe Mr. Demery was the commissioner then. Yes, okay. And, um... Uh, Subsequently, I met uh, Mr. Demery in February of 1988 for the first time, really the first time. We have, um... We were asked, uh, it took a while to get the response from Mr. Abrams, but uh, we were asking him contacts, how many contacts did, uh, did, did the Wynn Group have with, uh, with Mr. Demery? And um, um, he basically tried to say there weren't all that many contacts, and Mr. Lantos responded, would it surprise you to learn that according to a GSA sample of just 20% of the calls placed for Mr. Demery's office during a six-month period. This is 20% during a six-month period. August 1987 to February 1988, what I shall refer to as the Wind Group. You explained to me why that is a misnomer. He didn't like me referring to this Wind Group. Received 42 calls in, in a six-month period. Mr. Demery from the Wind Group. Now, that's 20%. If we extrapolate, we multiply it times five. Um, We've got, we've got a lot of calls. Um, did you ever make any of those calls? During that time period? Yeah. I did not. Okay. Did you uh, make calls to him uh, for other projects? Mr. During Demery, did you call Mr. Demery on, on other projects? A number of other HUD issues, single family foreclosures. Let me uh, ask you this. Did you ever contact Mr. Demery on any wind group projects? I did not. Okay. But you contacted him on other projects? other policies, including the revised procedures governing the new competitive selection process for Section 8 Mod Rehab. Did you, um, did he ever uh, act favorably on any project that you were advocating? I wasn't advocating any project. Did Mr. Demery ever uh, support any of the projects that you uh, are involved in? There was one project uh, that has been funded by a PHA, uh, which was funded uh, in 19 fiscal 88 or 89, Congressman. Okay, and what project Fis was that? Fiscal 89, I believe. What project was that? Uh, it is in Yuma, Arizona. Pardon me? Yuma, Arizona. Okay. Let me just ask you um, your involvement with uh, Mr. Demery um, and Food for Africa. Basically, the committee has not focused a lot of time on Food for Africa because uh, there's so much other things here. But um, it, it, I have to tell you that um, I find it extraordinary that, um, and I realize you've given to other organizations, 
but uh, is it not true that you went to New York to actually learn about Food for Africa? In other words, no one came to you to do this. You went there at Lance Wilson's urging. That is correct. Okay. And um, did you have to pay for your flight there and so on? And, I did. Yeah. How much did you ultimately contribute for Food for Africa? At that fundraiser, Congressman? Yes. $1, no, 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 not at that. No, ultimately. I believe uh, I indicated previously, Congressman, between 35 Why and 37 Why do you keep saying 000? previously? I, I don't. This morning. No, I, you can keep saying that, but I'm, you know, it's irrelevant Again, to me. 35 okay. to 37 thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, 35 thousand. That's correct. Okay. Um, can you tell me any other organization other than the campaign contribution uh, that approaches uh, your contribution of 35 thousand dollars? 10 thousand dollars, I can. To what? National Multiple Sclerosis Society. Uh, over a long period of time, or over a two-year period. Okay, uh, and that's been recent. Uh, was that before Food for Africa? Ten each. Was, pardon me. Ten each, Congressman, or to beneficiaries. Okay. okay. Was that after you contributed Food for Africa or before? That would have been uh, before and after. Okay. Now, um, isn't it also true that you actually uh, held a uh, a fundraiser for Food for Africa? That so, is true. So Congressman. besides contributing, you also, you also um, had a fundraiser for Food for Africa. I did, Congressman. Did you um, invite Mr. Demery to, to attend this? I did not. Was he there? He was. Uh, isn't it true he spoke? He did, very briefly. Uh, isn't it also true he made some reference to the fact, well, let me ask you this first question. Uh, who was the invited guests? Uh, Reverend Pretorius, his wife, and one of his children. Okay. Who were the invited guests for the... Uh, as a possible as possible contributors as contributors uh, my business associates or relationships uh, contractors architects that's principally it basically Property managers basically people who did business with HUD in this case yes yeah. so it was a, it was a HUD fundraiser it was a raise a fundraiser for food for Africa in which basically those who were dealing with HUD came most were dealing with HUD, that's correct. Okay. Uh, can you explain why Mr. Demery was there? I believe, Congressman, from memory, he was in town for another HUD function. What was uh, the other HUD function? A groundbreaking in northern Colorado for uh, affordable housing. And you were surprised to see him show up? I had been advised that he might appear. Okay. Now, Mr. Demery has basically said he had nothing to do with Food for Africa once he was, um, uh, had, had um, worked for... Uh, the government, that he resigned his position and so on. But isn't it true he uh, spoke at this fundraiser and encouraged people to contribute? He did speak. Uh, he made no encouragement, gave no encouragement. Did he make any reference to the fact that it looked like a convention of HUD employees and HUD uh, um, people who did dealings with HUD? Not in, based on my recollection. Okay. Um, Let me, let me first ask, does anyone else have any more questions? Because I will. I don't believe yeah, that. Okay. Um, I'd just like to, to say to you that um, uh, well, let me ask you this. Is it your testimony that you basically uh, worked with a system? How do, you, how do you appraise this system of allocating um, mod rehab projects? Was it a competitive system? Uh, or was it, uh, was it, uh, would you uh, describe it as something that was determined by the local groups or was it central? I mean, how do you describe, what was your understanding of how projects were allocated? Between Congressman 1980-81 uh, when Mod Rehab was first implemented and during that period of time there was substantial difficulty on the part of PHAs or developers in implementing the program. A large number of units were recaptured by HUD Washington. Let me ask the question this way. Okay. Isn't it true that you knew basically that HUD projects after 1986, even a little before, were, um, were uh, determined uh, based on what the central office decided? I believe between 81 and 86 that would have been true. Okay. Or up to March of 88. And did actually. you have an ex explanation of why the, the, the office, the central office, was making that decision? I believe, Congressman, uh, because of a limited number of resources available throughout the United States so it, for it, that program. Would it be your testimony that you realized that ultimately you had to be able to influence 
people at HUD Washington if you were going to see those projects allocated in areas that you wanted to build? To access, certainly. Uh, I just need for the record, and then I'll conclude. Um, were you aware that Linda Murphy was a close friend of Deborah Gordine? I was not. Okay. Um, so it would not be your testimony at all that, uh, uh, let me ask this question. Who did you think in Washington made the decisions on what projects would be funded? You knew it was centrally located. Who made those decisions? I really didn't know, Congressman. I just learned through these hearings that there uh, might have been a or was a committee of individuals or perhaps an individual, but I did not previously know the process. So it is going to be your testimony to us that as far as you were concerned, Deborah Gordeen had no, uh, you had no knowledge that Deborah Gordeen was a player in deciding who got mod rehab projects. This is, and, and I just want, I couldn't let testify me just say to, to you, you've done nothing illegal here but, but it, I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, but I want to know the truth. Are you testifying to us that you had no knowledge that Deborah Gordine uh, was involved in the selection of mod rehab projects? I'm not testifying to that. Okay. Then I'm unclear as to what you're testifying. Well, I'm suggesting, Congressman, that uh, by virtue of the letters, for example, this one before me, and calls that were placed, as Mr. Wynn has testified, to Ms. Dean, that she was a player. Okay. in the allocation process. So you knew when you worked for the Wynn Group that Deborah Gordine was a key player in the allocation of mod rehab projects? I had the belief. That's correct. Okay. And it would be your testimony that, uh, that um, your partners uh, maintained a relationship with Deborah Gordine. While you didn't, they did. They were in contact with her. I believe they were. Okay. Did you know that Tom Demery was a, a player in deciding who got mod rehab? Funding? I did not. I didn't know how okay. units were allocated. Wait a second. You're saying you knew Deborah Gordine was. But I assume that she continued in that capacity. But, but you're saying to me During that, the Wind Group projects now. You're saying to me that the, you, you, you didn't have an appreciation that the FHA commissioner, Tom Demery, made, had an impact and helped decide who got projects? I wouldn't say that, Congressman. I okay, assume I need to know what you'd okay. say. I believe that for a period of time, through the time that Ms. Dean was uh, with HUD as executive secretary and executive assistant, uh, that she was a player in the process. I also believe prior to that time that the assistant secretary of housing, no matter who it is, had some responsibility and authority for allocating uh, HUD resources, including Section 8. Why, why would you have been reluctant to tell me that you knew that Tom Demery was a player? Why would you be reluctant? I wasn't saying reluctant, Congressman. I was saying that uh, I assume that any Assistant Secretary for Housing or Community Planning and Development was I must have misheard you. I thought you told me that you weren't, weren't aware that Tom Demery was a player, so I must have misunderstood well, you. I may have said that. If I did, I misspoke. Okay. So you were aware, you were aware that Deborah Gordeen was a player, you were Indirectly, aware, that's correct. Yes, and you were aware that Tom Demery was virtue his position as FHA commissioner. Correct. Uh, who else would you have identified as, as a major player? No one that I'm aware of. Okay. Well, you got two of the key players, you know. Um, um, and, and in one case, uh, as it relates to Tom Demery, uh, you were very willing to spend uh, for a, a, a program you believed in. I sincerely believe you believed in it. It's a kind of a win-win. You can do good and you can also benefit a relationship. But you contributed $35,000 to a particular fund, Food for Africa. And when we look at Food for Africa, we see something that's very clear, that the, ma that the major amount of money that was contributed was contributed by people who had dealings with HUD. And that when you talk about fundraisers, uh, whether it's Lance Wilson encouraging you to contribute or Joe Strauss to contribute, he's looking to develop a relationship uh, that uh, clearly uh, was a strong one with Tom Demery. And um, so you, 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 you had your bases covered, it seems to me. Uh, you developed a relationship with Tom Demery and you, and you knew your, your partners had a relationship with Deborah Gordine and you've told me that you knew they were the two key players um, virtue their decisions and the end result is that you've been extraordinarily successful in getting funding. Um, but I will also say to you that I also know that you prepared uh, your work well and you brought your competence beside. 
You did not design this project. You've told me that, and others have told me that. You didn't create it, but you knew how it worked, and you had to work with that system. Um, is that a fair analysis? That is fair. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Do you have anything you would like to add, Mr. Queenan? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could, uh, please, just for the record, uh, I would like to emphasize that I did not support a reduction in federal housing program levels. I've always supported, uh, perhaps erroneously, given the budget deficit, but a, the maximum amount of units that could be allocated throughout the United States. Uh, during the Carter administration, I believe there were as many as 400,000 units. Uh, the units, the program levels were reduced over time, admittedly. There are a number of good programs that I think that HUD could look at re-implementing. For example, the Housing Development Grant Program. I thank you for the opportunity. Yes, we have one more question from Congress. Uh, I, I do want to put on the record, you made, um, and I looked at my notes, and I'm sorry I forgot to ask you. You said until 1981 to 1987, you knew it was centrally driven and not based on competition and so on. You then said, based on, I don't want to put words in your mouth, let me finish and then correct me if I'm wrong. You said in, in 1987 the system changed? Uh, 1988. Oh, I'm sorry, 1980. So March. 1981 to 1988, the system worked one way, a way that, you know, consultants were needed and people had influence. You needed to hire people who had influence or work with people who had influence. What happened in 1988 that you think is important for us to know? Uh, if I could, Congressman, to yeah. back up to yeah. 81 through March of 88. Yes, sir. I believe that uh, HUD fair share during that period, up to the change in regulations, uh, Section eight, all assisted housing funds, but particularly Section 8 mod rehab. So during some period of time, from 81 through perhaps 84, they were fair shared. Subsequently, the fair share regulations were lifted or reinterpreted, whatever term you'd like to use. And they were discretionary in nature. And you knew that as the time, as an active player in the HUD projects, you knew that then. You're not telling us now. Any participant in the program knew that. Okay. Yeah. Then in March of 88, the uh, procedures, administrative procedures, were uh, substantially revised and allowed for, encouraged, required competitive selection. Okay. Now, who do you give credit for doing that? Uh, HUD itself. Okay. Um, do you feel any one individual was responsible for, for making those changes? Well, I assume the Assistant Secretary and the Secretary at the time. Certainly the Assistant Secretary. Do you assume Secretary. it or do you feel you know it? Well, the signature on the memorandum implementing those procedures is that of the then Assistant Secretary for Housing, FHA Commissioner. Which was who? Mr. Demery. Okay. So is it, is it your statement to this committee that you feel in, in March of 88 that the system had been corrected? Uh, how would you describe that change? I would say the previous system was extremely flawed and the revisions were tremendous and sweeping, uh, furthering, ensuring competitive selection. And you made a comment to me, uh, or you may have made it to someone else, that uh, you, uh, what is, do you feel that that system is the correct system now? I mean, could we, could we take Mr. Demery's memo of 1987 and, and use it now and have a system that would work well? I think you could. Uh, it's been subsequently revised as I've interpreted the Federal Register, but that, even that had some criticism. For example, there were communities in California, Congressman, uh, where you've seen the Wall Street Journal, they were criticized in other trade journals for allowing Laguna Beach to be eligible or Beverly Hills. Uh, no system is perfect, no administrative system, certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Our next witness, uh, uh, Mr. Carmen, will uh, come up to the witness table. Mr. Carmen, raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the